Hi, I'm Semen Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Spikes and Oscillations Deciphering the Output Waveform of a Shunt Current Sensor. Now we are using shunt resistors in order to measure current. Here I'm showing a synchronous buck. These are the two transistors, inductor. Here we have the shunt resistor. This would be an amplifier, presumably an isolation amplifier or a differential amplifier. And here in the output section, we have the filter capacitor and this represents the load. Now the output voltage would be the current going through here times the resistance times the gain of this amplifier. So the current is going to be, in general, if you are talking about CCM going up and down with a certain ripple, and this waveform is supposed to be picked up by the voltage drop here, and then amplified and transferred to the output, which is then fed to the control unit. Recently, a post at the LinkedIn showed a waveform like this. This is exactly the situation we are talking about. This is the output of the sensor. This is the midpoint between these two transistors. This is the voltage here, which is going to have a square wave when the transistor, the upper transistor is on, we're going to see the voltage here. And when it's this one is conducting, it's going to be zero. So this is the yellow one and the green one. Now, as we see here, this waveform is far from being smooth and representing just a simple ripple. We see here at least two phenomena. We see a jump here and a jump here. We see some oscillation. And in fact, we see here like spikes here and probably here. So it's far from being a very simple waveform as we would expect in the ideal case. We have these jumps here as well as the oscillation. So the objective of this presentation is to explain what are the reasons for the corruption of the waveform. And I'm going to do that by running an LT spy simulation and probing into the waveform that we are getting. I'm assuming there is no measurement noise injected. That is what we see is primarily the actual measurement. So there is no common mode noise or maybe some coupling from other uh, switchers into the measurement circuit. To do that, I prepared this very simple schematics. It includes a square wave waveform here, voltage source. This is the main inductor. This is the shunt resistor, and this is the output capacitance. However, to make it more realistic, and this is something I'm going to explore, I have added to the shunt resistor, I have added an inductance here and a parallel capacitor, which also may represent the measurement circuit, the input to the amplifier. I have added here ESR and ESL. And also, very important, as we will see, I have added here the parallel capacitance of the inductor. Now, this represents the interwinding capacitances. This is a lump presentation. It is, as it turns out, very important in the process we're going to explore. Now, at the beginning, I'm going to assume that none of these parasitic elements has any influence. And this is by assuming that they are very small. For example, this is one femtofarad, which is 10 to the minus 15. So it really doesn't have any actual effect on the circuit. So here are the results of this run of the ideal case in which we have no parasitics at all. This is the midpoint here. This is the point here. This will represent the midpoint between the two transistors. And here I'm seeing both the inductor current and the voltage across the shunt resistor. These are just adjusted scale so that the sh I'm showing that they are exactly the same. And what you'll measure in the ideal case is, of course, the waveform of the inductor. This is the current ripple of the inductor. Now I'm going to add some parasitics, and the first step will be to add some inductance to the shunt resistor. Now this is 5 nanohenry. It's much more than you'd expect or would like to have. And this is just for the sake of emphasizing the effect. In reality, you like it to be very, very small. And obviously, there are special shunt resistors. 
uh, with very low inductance. So again, this is just uh, to enhance the effect. So here is what we see. So let me start here. This green is the ripple current, okay, the inductor current. The red one here with the jump is what we see across the resistor plus inductance. This is the complete shunt. What we see here are two jumps. We see a jump here and a jump here, and there is also an offset. Again, the scales were adjusted, so they represent the same situation. So what is the reason for the jump? Well, the reason is that as the current is passing through the inductor here, there is a slope here, there is a di dt here, and so th therefore there is a voltage. So the voltage across the inductor, this is the voltage across the inductor itself. This is the voltage across the pure resistor with no prosthetic inductor. So this waveform is the sum of these. Now the voltage of the inductor is positive here because there is a positive slope here. So this is this section here. And then it's negative here. This is negative number here. Okay, it's negative here because there is a down slope, a negative slope. So we see a jump here between here and here. So the total jump is between the plus and the minus, a voltage due to this slope and the voltage due to this slope. So this is this jump here. And obviously the jump here is exactly the same because here we are moving from low to high here, low to high and here from high to low. So these jumps are the same. Now, this waveform is of course a little bit off because of the jump. Also, it is offset because of the added value of the voltage due to the voltage of the inductor. So we have a added value here. And here, there's a lower value, but it's a little bit smaller because being asymmetrical waveform, because the duty cycle is such that I have a short on and a long off, so this one is high and this one is low, so therefore this offset is lower. So we understand now that the jump is due to the inductance, the size of these jumps is the same, and then we have some offset depending on the voltage here and the voltage here. Now I'm going to complicate the situation by adding some capacitance across the shunt resistor. Again, this is very high for a resistor, but uh, taking into account the amplifier, this might be a reasonable uh, capacitance. So in this case, I don't see any big difference. This is just showing the waveform itself. This is the output of the sensor that is resistor plus inductor. This is the current, the green is the current, and we see the same picture here, there's a jump here, same jump here, the offset, and offset here. But what will happen if I'm going to include the capacitance of the main inductor, okay? And again, this is 5 nano Henry, this is this capacitance, I'm here making it again zero, so for the shunt we have only the resistance, and the inductance, plus, of course, this uh, capacitance, parasitic capacitance of the main inductor. Well, here it is. First of all, look at this. These are the current that will pass through this capacitor of the inductor, that is, this capacitor. Now, obviously, the magnitude here will depend on the rise and fall time of the voltage here, okay? So this is just a private case, of course. And lo and behold, in this case, we do have oscillation. We see oscillation here. We see oscillation here. Again, this is the same scale. These are different scales. This, this is the same thing, except that here I have adjusted the scale so it'll look the same. So the green is the inductor current, the ripple here. And this is the output of the sensor, that is resistor plus inductor, now including the capacitance of the main inductor. Now, as you look at this, this is very similar to what has been actually measured. 
here it is. If we see the jump, we see the oscillation. Obviously, the oscillation here are lower, and this will depend on the magnitude of the injection, also on the damping of the system, how fast does it damp. But in general, we see the same thing here. And here, we can see also a big jump, which can also be associated with the injection of the current via the capacitor of the inductor. So here is what we see, and we can conclude that uh, at this point that uh, the major effects that we see in the measurement is the jump and the oscillation can be explained by the inductance of the shunt resistor and the injection of current or spikes via the capacitance of the main inductor. Now the frequency of oscillation will depend on the capacitance here and the inductance here. So if I do a simple calculation taking the capacitance, inductance, I find that the calculated value for the oscillation, expected oscillation, is 1.59 and lo and behold zooming in and measuring the oscillation, the frequency of the oscillation, I got exactly the same. So this really explains what is happening in this circuit. Now what happens if I'm changing the rise time of the voltage here? This will be depending on the rise time of the transistors, of course. And I've made a small change. Originally, this was also 100 nanosecond. I've changed it to 200, so it's not too much. And here is what I'm getting. Doesn't look that it's a major change. There are some small changes here, of course. But again, it is a function of the rise time. And if in the extreme cases, the rise time will be very short or very long, you'd expect to have some changes in the waveform here. So now, what about capacitance here? To demonstrate it, I've added a one picofarad across the shunt element. Again, I have here the two picofarad for the capacitance of the inductor and, of course, the inductance of the shunt resistor. And here is what I'm getting. Looks in general the same, although it seems that the oscillation become much larger and let's compare it. So this is the case which I'm now examining, that is one picofarad across the shunt element, while here is zero picofarad. And you can clearly see that the oscillation here are more intense than here. And the reason is that we have now another path to the current through here. So as we have a transition here, we have a higher spike going through out here, and therefore the intensity of the current is higher, and therefore the oscillation will be much higher. And this is what we see here with this added one picofarad capacitor. Now we would expect that the ESR and ESL of the capacitor would also have effect on what we see here. And the reason is that the path here for the current, for the injection, and especially the rise and fall time is going through this capacitor. And depending on then on the impedance of this capacitor for high frequency, we may have a change in the waveform. So to examine this, I have added one nano Henry to the capacitor. This is the ESL of this capacitor. And here is what I see. This is with the inductance added to the capacitor. And this is without the inductance. Now, obviously, we see that the inductance is actually damping a bit the oscillation as compared to the case where there is no inductance. And this makes sense because if you add here an inductance, then the spike of the current that's going through here is going to be less because of the higher impedance here to the high frequency, and therefore it will sort of lower the magnitude of the oscillation. So what are the conclusions here? The parasitic inductance of a shunt resistor causes equal jumps at the two current extremes because we are adding or subtracting a voltage 
to the voltage across the pure resistor. And the main inductor capacitance plays a major role in the oscillation. So it is very important parameter to take into account when you are designing a system. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.